Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel, and thanks for logging on. No sooner did we receive our new 2018 Breitling Premier Collection timepieces at our flagship Center City Philadelphia Gothburg store than I sensed a rivalry brewing between the mainstays of their respective collections, the Breitling Premier Chronograph 42. $6,550 US, and the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch, $5,250 as shown. We're going to compare them, I'm going to pick a winner, we're going to contrast, and you guys will make your choice in the comment threads below. Let's start with the Challenger, because you guys know the Moonwatch pretty well. We're going to talk about the Premier Chronograph 42, powered by a 7750 and chronometer spec. The watch is true to its name. Inspired by the mid-century era of Mies van der Rohe, Charles and Ray Ames, the study houses, and the period when Art Deco and pre-World War II modernist design went mainstream in the form of appliances, autos, and residential and commercial properties. The watch is very much in the spirit of the 1940s and 50s Breitling Premier Collection, and it draws heavily on that design language. But 42 is the size, and thus 42 modern and impressively stanced on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It's not a retro watch, it is a modern timepiece. 13.9 millimeters thick, it's much easier to wear underneath the sleeve than the similarly thick but differentially uh, shaped moon watch. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's a big watch across the wrist, 49.9, but it's not the monster that Breitling lugs have been in the past. Even with the solid end links of the bracelet, it's a wearable. 53.7 millimeters, and I would endorse it for wrists as small as 14 and a half centimeters circumference. Now, this is where you really see a key distinction in the two watches, and it is the interaction of the bracelet end links with the lugs. First, you can see the Omega is a very old fashioned 20 millimeter spacing with interaction that seems to suggest this is merely the latest in a long string of bracelets and end links passing through this model. The case doesn't change, the bracelets and end links always do. Whereas here you have what is best described as a scratch-built combination of lug, end link, and bracelet. All of these things were clearly designed to work together, and thus 22 millimeters, a more modern spacing and a better fit between the components. The bracelet is the seven-link Navitimer style bracelet. Five-link is the traditional Breitling Pilot Bracelet. This is in that fashion, but again, it's the seven link, not five. Satin finished on the flanks, high polish on the top. It has the substance and solidity of a sports watch bracelet, but thanks to the many small articulated links, it has the souplesse as well as the delicacy to the eye and the wrist that you get in a dress bracelet. Big gaps on the underside to avoid pinching skin, pulling hair. You can see screw fixed, removable links. And the clasp here is a single fold deployant with a clamshell lock. Breitling's new logo, the Bee Without Wings, emphasizing that this is a company for land, sea, and air, not merely the air, and the premiere, in case you're wondering, is the Land Collection. The timepiece featuring an unsung feature. There are actually four anchoring points inside the clasp, and you can move the bracelet in or out to properly size using a strap tool without being obligated to store or add a removable link. So you have that extra element of adjustability. It is a stamped clasp versus the milled clasp of the Omega. Jump into the case, you can see this is one area where the Omega clearly shows its origins in the 1950s and 60s with a very slim mid case. It's almost a rule of thirds. You have the mid case, you have the bezel structure, and then you have the case back. So there's not a whole lot of material in any one structure. Whereas this is a modern watch with a dominant mid case form, and these horizontal gadrons, again, think mid century modern, have been added to give it a little bit more of a machine aesthetic ethic as well as break up the shear of the flanks. Now, the lugs represent a huge improvement over previous Breitling practice. New C CEO Georges Kern has said he wants to remove the brutalist lugs from the Breitling collection so they look right and wear right. A success on both counts here. A combination of polish as well as satin to break up the mass of this case band. And then you can really see the distinction between the bezel forms here. First, the bezel of the Omega has a dramatic cantilevered profile. So even though the watches are only half a millimeter different in actual thickness, the Omega wears much thicker. It tends to hang up on a cuff. Another feature that really sets the two apart is the fact that the Omega turns its tachymeter into an external bezel structure, whereas the tachymeter of the Breitling is internal. Another distinction is that the Omega has true Hesalite thermoplastic crystal, the better to not shatter in space. Easier to scratch, harder to shatter, that's NASA spec. And the Breitling has a box section sapphire that's designed to look like a mid-century plexiglass or thermoplastic. So it has the scratch resistance. We'll cement the bubble charm of the original plexiglass is retained, it doesn't have the tendency to scratch. You will note that the Breitling dial has far more depth about it. 
starting at the tachymeter outboard and working down to the wells of the countersunk registers, you have a tone-on-tone -tone look with the tachymeter being a silver metallic, and you'll note cantilevered over the inner bezel. All applique indices, applique Breitling logo, and then you have countersunk sub-registers with a date at 6 o'clock. A key distinction between the Omega and the Breitling is the presence of that date. Now, if you're one to think that the lack of a date is a feature, not a bug, perhaps you go Moonwatch, but it is a functionality advantage for many. You'll also note that the Breitling features a vintage-inspired, deeply knurled, premier-specific crown that will only be seen on the premieres, as well as rectangular, squared-off, 1940s-style pushers, whereas the Omega has more of a 50s and 60s-style pump-pusher arrangement with a sheer guard countersunk crown. Now, jumping back to the dials, you can see that the Breitling has all applique indices, but they're not loomed. Only the hands are loomed, whereas on the Omega, you could easily argue that day or night, it's an easier watch to read. Now, we're going to jump over to the Omega, do a quick wrist impression and then score this round. The Omega is a 42, but it wears differently. First, it's thicker, but it's the cantilever of that bezel that's going to challenge your cuff. It's not the thickness of the watch, it's the overhang. 48.5 uh, millimeters lug to lug, if you include the solid end links, 54.1, so even though it looks smaller, it actually winds up a bit broader than the Breitling across the wrist. The bracelet, you can see a three-link design, alternately polished and brushed. It does owe a nod of acknowledgement to the Rolex Oyster Bracelet. Removable links sized with screws. I do prefer the clasp right here. Being milled out from the solid, it feels more secure, and with a twin trigger release rather than a clamshell, it feels more expensive. The uh, timepiece does feature everything you expect of a moon watch, right down to a case profile that's plainly designed for a strap rather than a bracelet, so there is that integration issue, but it's elegant, and it's vintage evocative without being retro because it's never changed. You have that polished bevel the sheer side, and of course the sheer guards for pushers and crown that have been around since 1965. The dial is perfectly balanced, matte finished, and it features a white on matte black print. Everything is easier to read because instead of polished hands, you have painted hands, and b instead of polished indices, you have printed indices. Contrast is higher both day and night. It's always an easier watch to read, and I'll also mention that when you do turn off the lights. The Omega has a lit seconds hand, whereas the Breitling does not. Now, movement. Valju 7750 and COSC chronometer spec, 48-hour power reserve, automatic winding, hacking seconds, quick set date, 100 meters water resistant. Right here, so 7750 base, Breitling caliber 13. Right here, Omega caliber 1861 based on the Lamagna 1873 of Bausch. Manual wind, 48-hour power reserve. It's a 21.6 beat rate versus 28.8 for the Breitling. It's not a chronometer. It doesn't feature hacking seconds, but it does feature a tank tough manual wind lateral clutch and cam operated system that is just a little bit tougher than the 7750. It's also a lateral clutch cam system, but the additional complexity of the winding system adds a vulnerability under extreme conditions. 50 meters water resistant though, so while it is a tougher watch in theory, something as simple as excess water pressure could fell the mighty moon watch, so keep that in mind. Of course, the dial is simple, easy to read, functional, but more basic without the date. And of course, it has that Hesolite, which is going to drive some people crazy because because it can scratch, and it will do so with relative frequency compared to a sapphire, which, short of disaster, is pretty much binary. It's broken or it's not, and more often it's not. There's no doubting that this watch has a richer dial. It has the convenience of automatic winding. It has the convenience and practicality of a date. It has the precision of a chronometer and the hacking seconds function that the Omega does not have. It has a higher beat rate for still greater potential accuracy, a more modern wrist stance, a better integration of bracelet, lug, and end link, as well as a richer dial with greater depth, and you can clearly see where the money was spent. The $1,300 price point of this watch does seem fitting, based on what you see externally and internally. The Omega has historical authenticity. It's not vintage-inspired. It is simply one on broken continuity and still NASA issue. It is a watch that is in every way an all-timer and priced $1,300 less than the Breitling. It doesn't have automatic winding, it doesn't have a date, and some will say hurrah for that. More interaction with your watch and purity of form inside and out. For me, the Moon Watch is the winner, but to be honest, you can't go wrong with either. And now let's cut to the loom shot. The loom shot, the Omega Moon Watch versus the Breitling Premier Chronograph 42. No contest.